en tant que doyen de la faculté des lettres, langues et sciences humaines à l'Université d'Orléans. C'est donc mon privilège de vous souhaiter la bienvenue sur le campus orléanais, qui est fier de pouvoir accueillir le 24e congrès sur le traitement automatique des langues naturelles, TALN 2017. Les trois laboratoires de recherche, deux orléanais, un tourangeau, sur lesquels repose cette aventure scientifique, ont décliné la notion du TAL de trois façons différentes. TALN, récital et enfin CITAL, autrement dit recherche, formation par et à la recherche et application socio-économique. Le programme qui en résulte s'annonce passionnant, même pour le shakespearien, fatalement en conflit avec le numérique qui vous parle. J'espère que vous allez trouver nos locaux propices à toutes les activités liées à la vie du congressiste, aux keynotes, aux ateliers, poster sessions bien sûr, mais aussi et peut-être surtout à la rencontre, aux échanges, aux prises de contact, à la conception de projets. Je sais que les organisatrices et organisateurs du colloque ont tout prévu pour vous rendre votre séjour dans notre établissement aussi profitable et mémorable que possible. Certes, le Wooded Campus, qui vous a été annoncé dans l'appel à communication, a quelque peu souffert de la chaleur des dernières semaines, mais le patrimoine vert ou jaune de notre université vaut toujours une promenade de découverte entre deux sessions. J'ai constaté avec intérêt que le programme du mercredi après-midi prévoit même des activités sportives et culturelles. Bref, il me semble que l'organisation et le lieu même du Congrès sont à la hauteur de ce que vous êtes en droit d'attendre d'un tel événement. Nous avons à la faculté de lettres, langues et sciences humaines à Orléans, bien sûr, l'habitude d'organiser et de mener à bien des colloques et des grands congrès dans les différentes disciplines réunies ici ou aussi dans un esprit interdisciplinaire. TALN 2017 revêt cependant une importance particulière parce que ce congrès, dans ce contexte, témoigne de l'intérêt que portent nos disciplines et en premier lieu les sciences du langage au numérique. Autrement dit, les humanités ont leur mot à dire sur les évolutions cognitives, technologiques, socioculturelles et politiques du numérique. Cela semble plus, plutôt évident pour l'étude des langues. C'est cependant aussi les cas dans les domaines éthiques, esthétiques, culturels, etc. Ce congrès participe ainsi à la lutte des lettres, langues et sciences humaines de se dégager de certains stéréotypes qui nous collent, notamment celui d'un conservatisme culturel arriéré qui produit du chômage. TALN 2017 nous aide à briser ce cliché. Je tiens en somme à vous remercier de votre contribution à ce congrès et tiens surtout à remercier les organisatrices et les organisateurs de leur travail de préparation et de leur investissement qui ont rendu possible cet événement important. Je vous souhaite donc trois jours de travaux et de rencontres passionnants. Merci beaucoup. Chers talistes, bienvenue à Orléans. Cette édition euh, est organisée par trois laboratoires. Donc un laboratoire euh, légérien de linguistique, donc c'est un labo de linguistique, et deux laboratoires en informatique, laboratoire de l'informatique fondamentale d'Orléans et laboratoire informatique de Tours. Donc déjà, vous pouvez nous reconnaître, donc les membres du comité d'organisation, par un tour de cou qui est blanc, contrairement au vôtre qui est noir. Donc si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à venir nous voir, on, on sera toujours là. Euh, je veux également remercier tous nos euh, partenaires et sponsors qui ont permis euh, un bon déroulement de cet événement. Donc c'est évidemment euh, Atala, le DGLF, euh, l'agglomération d'Orléans, euh, la région centre, l'université d'Orléans, les entreprises comme Inventa, Proxem, Acatus, Actan, etc. 
Et donc, si j'oublie quelqu'un, si, si quelqu donc ne soyez pas euh, fâchés. Euh, on accueille cette année 180 participants. Hier, lundi, il y a eu, ont, eu, ont eu lieu quatre ateliers thématiques. Euh, L'atelier digital consacré au traitement automatique des langues peu dotées, le DEFT. Euh, la première fois, je pense que c'était l'atelier aussi euh, consacré au corpus annoté. Et la deuxième édition d'Acatal. À partir d'aujourd'hui jusqu'à jeudi, on va entendre 27 présentations orales, dont 14 articles longs, 8 articles courts et 5 posters. Euh, Certaines sessions vont commencer par la présentation courte de nos partenaires et de nos sponsors. Ensuite, euh, vendredi, euh, vendredi, il y aura l'exposition de 30 posters et euh, la réalisation de 14 démonstrations. Euh, vendredi aussi, c'est euh, la journée qui est dédiée au salon d'innovation, dans le cadre duquel sont organisées euh, trois tables rondes euh, en matinée, euh, le TAL et magnété numérique, le traitement automatique du langue, euh, de la langue biomédicale et euh, le TAL dans l'expérience d'utilisateur. Et euh, la conférence va finir par une table ronde finale intitulée euh, « TAL aujourd'hui et demain, nouvelles méthodes, nouveaux usages, nouvelles applications ». Tout au long de la conférence, à partir de demain, les jeunes chercheurs et les étudiants peuvent s'inscrire au déjeuner avec experts que nous avons appelé « Comment tal et vous ?». C'est sur le site, donc vous pouvez aller voir dans les actualités, vous pouvez vous inscrire donc pour déjeuner avec les experts. Oui, j'ai oublié aussi de dire que pour les posters, on a jeudi matin, on a le booster de posters, c'est-à-dire la présentation d'une minute et trente de chaque poster. C'est le jeudi matin. Maintenant, les choses sympathiques, n'oubliez pas que aujourd'hui, nous vous attendons à l'hôtel Grolot, c'est donc au centre d'Orléans, pour le cocktail de bienvenue. Mercredi, demain, on croise les doigts qu'il fasse beau, <rire> pas trop chaud, mais qu'il ne pleuve pas surtout. On vous propose trois activités pour ceux qui sont inscrits. C'est le canoë, les bateaux et la visite de la ville. Je vous dis tout de suite qu'on a les places libres encore. On a sept places au canoë, euh, neuf places pour les visites. Euh, pour le bateau, c'est complet pour le moment. Euh, pour le bateau, par contre, attention particulière, il y a deux sorties. Il y a une sortie à 15h30 et une sortie à 16h30. Donc, je demande pour les gens qui sont inscrits pour une balade en bateau, venir quand vous avez pendant les pauses, dans les, là où il y a les tables d'inscription, pour marquer quels horaires vous préférez. Jeudi, le dîner gala le soir, dans un endroit secret, où pas mal de surprises vous attendent. Donc, je vous attends tous. Euh, donc, je pense que j'ai fini pour les questions organisationnelles. Est-ce que vous avez des questions Pas de questions De toute façon, vous pouvez toujours nous venir vous les poser. Alors, je déclare la conférence TLN 2017 ouverte. Et je donne la parole à Agatha Savary qui va présenter notre premier conférencier. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Hi everyone. <coughs> so it's my honor and my great pleasure to introduce Shirley Wintner, uh, who is professor of, uh, professor of computer science at the University of Haifa in Israel. So Shirley uh, received his PhD degree from the Technion uh, Institute of Technology in Haifa. He was uh, postdoctoral student at the University of Tübingen in Germany, at the University of Pennsylvania in um, Philadelphia, and a visiting professor at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. <coughs> His service to, uh, f to higher education and, and research is quite substantial, so I just name a few roles that he played. He uh, was editor-in-chief of the Uh, research on, on language and computation. Uh, he was general chair of the EACL conference uh, in Gothenburg in 2014. He's a co-author of a reference book on uh, unification grammars. Uh, he chaired or was a member of do dozens of program committees. He co-authored, uh, I think, 40 uh, refereed journal papers, 13 book chapters, 50 conference papers. And uh, his research interests span quite a, a large um, a range of topics. 
from uh, formal grammars and um, unification and grammar engineering um, to uh, transliteration, morphological and syntactic analysis of Hebrew, um, finite state techniques, uh, language acquisition, uh, multiple expression identification and parsing, and last but not least, the translation is. So uh, this means features of texts translated by humans, and especially the ways they can be leveraged in automatic uh, applications and NLP applications. And this is precisely what today's talk is about, right? Uh, so um, I think Shuli likes taking questions any time you want, right? If you want qu to ask questions during the talk, you're welcome. Otherwise, you will also have some minutes to for, t for questions after the talk. So let's offer him a warm welcome. Thanks a lot, Agatha, for this wonderful introduction. You memorized my CV. I don't think I know it by heart. Je suis désolé, mais je ne peux pas parler français well enough in order to deliver this uh, this talk. So I will switch to English. Thanks a lot, Agatha, again, and thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here, and it's a it's a pleasure to visit Orleans. It's my first time. So, <coughs> as mentioned, the main question I'm looking at is given two texts, like these two here, both of them are in English. One of them was originally written in English, and the other was translated from French to English. And the question is, can you tell which is which? As you can see, the, the, the texts are formal, they are written in uh, fluent English, they're more or less the same genre, the same domain, the same register, and so on. But one of them was translated, and the other is what I'm going to call original. So O stands for original, and T stands for, trans for translation. And the answer is no, you cannot. Humans are not very good at these tasks. I'm talking about professional translation. I'm not talking about poor quality translation, the kind of things that you sometimes may see you know, translations done by amateurs. No, I'm talking about professional translators who are paid to do their job. And I should mention at the very start that it is customary in the, in the, in the translation circles to, uh, for one to translate into one's um, stronger language. So if I'm a bilingual speaker of Hebrew and English, Hebrew is my uh, uh, native language, then I'm um, I, that I can translate from English to Hebrew, but not the other way around. Okay, so these translations were uh, done by native speakers of the target language. And so to the human eye, these texts look sort of the same, but um, we have a long history of research in translation studies that says that they are not. And my um, main um, research question in the line of works that I will survey to you today is what are those features that make translations differ from texts originally written in the same language? What are, those, what are those features and how can we go about identifying them? So the underlying assumptions are that translated texts in any language differ from original ones. And uh, in, in fact, um, it is assumed, again, by uh, translation scientists that um, um, this Set, the set of translated texts in any language forms some kind of uh, sub-language. It's sometimes called a dialect or a genre, but it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it should be easily identified. And as I mentioned, translation studies is the field of research that handles these kind of questions. Translation studies has uh, originally started in the humanities. It's a relatively young field of research. And um, most of us in natural language processing are typically unaware of it, the, the mere existence of translation studies, but we'll talk about that later. And the assumption here is that computational methodologies can shed light on certain processes and help us under, better understand what it is that makes uh, translations different. So these are the assumptions, and this is uh, uh, an outline of what I want to go over uh, this morning. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a very brief um, um, sketch of uh, 
several hypotheses from translation studies that try to explain why is it that translations look differently and what it is that they differ from original texts in. And then I will uh, very briefly survey a few words that de dealt with um, uh, these differences in the translation studies literature, but I will uh, uh, immediately move on to some of our, um, uh, our own works, so works done uh, in, in my group back in Haifa, uh, whose aim is mainly to use um, uh, text classification methodologies to uh, pin down the differences between originals and translations. I'll talk about uh, supervised classification experiments and unsupervised classification experiments, or clustering. And then uh, what's going to really emerge from this discussion is the power of a certain phenomenon called interference. This is the influence, the, the fingerprints of the source language on the product of the translation. And I'll talk uh, uh, in more detail about uh, interference. And then if we have enough time, um, I will also extend the scope of this work a little bit to talk not just on translations, but also on other um, instances of language produced by bilinguals, in this case, non-native speakers uh, versus native speakers. Uh, we'll see how this goes. You, will you show me time signs? Um, I don't even, yeah. maybe I should have something here. No, I'm okay, I'm okay. Oh, you have time signs, great. So you, you're gonna keep time for me, good. So let's start. We start with uh, uh, some survey of, uh, of uh, the main hypothesis known from translation studies. Um, um, as I told you, this is, a, this is a relatively young field of research. We're talking about 40, 50 years. The underlying assumption is that translations differ from original texts, and this difference, as I mentioned, do not result from the poor quality of the translation. Rather, they are uh, just different um, uh, distributions of statistical features uh, that distinguish between originals and, uh, and translations. It was Yellowstone in uh, about 30 years ago that uh, used the term translation is to refer to the genre or sub-language of translated texts, irrespective of their language. Early works um, um, differentiated between two types of such features or such differences. TUI, uh, defined two laws of translation, and these laws are very different from each other. One of them is the law of interference. He says that uh, there are fingerprints of the source text that are still um, um, remaining on the, on the product of the translation and, and may, uh, may be identified. So this is interference, and note that by definition, interference is a phenomenon that is dependent on both the source and the target language. So it's a, it's a it's a language pair dependent phenomenon. In contrast, he defines the law of growing standardization. He claims that the translators tend, even if it's subconscious, to adhere more to the norms and standards of the target language when they produce the, their translations. Now this is, uh, this is um, a phenomenon that's completely independent of the source language. It may depend on the target language or it may be uh, a rather general phenomenon. And then it is uh, Baker, back in 1993, who defines translation universals. Again, notice that by definition, these are supposed to be universal, so completely independent of both the source and the target language. And these are features which typically occur in translated texts, rather than original utterances, and which are not the result of interference. What are those universals? There are three, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes four, but let's focus on three. One of them is simplification, the other is explicitation, and the third one is normalization. Let's talk a little bit about each one of them. So what's simplification? Simplification is the tendency, again, conscious or subconscious, doesn't matter, the tendency of the translator to make the product of the translation simpler than the original. Simpler in what sense? In the sense that uh, the translator would use fewer words, fewer unique words, shorter words, shorter sentences, more frequent and more common words, and stuff like that. This is simplification. The second universal is called explicitation. This is the tendency of the translator to make explicit in the product of the translation things that were implicit in the source. So the, the translator feels some kind of obligation to make the text clearer when he or she 
is doing the translation. And this can be, uh, in particular, can be um, uh, manifested by uh, certain discourse uh, markers such as, you know, moreover or hence or therefore that were not there in the source but are there in the target. And then there's normalization. This is what Turi called standardization. This is uh, some preference to conventional grammaticality. I'll give you an example of standardization. Um, uh, we all study, studied English. I somehow assume that most of us are not native speakers of English. So we all studied English and we all know the difference between but and however. But is used in, a center, in the middle of a sentence. However can be used in the beginning of a sentence, but you're not supposed, at least I was taught, you're not supposed to start a sentence with but. So when, um, um, uh, when non-native speakers speak English, they would try not to start a new sentence in but. Native speakers of English couldn't care less. They never heard this law, they never learned English, so they use but all over the place, in particular in the beginning of sentences. So if you look at translations, you see that they tend to over-standardize. They would not use but in the beginning of a sentence, whereas original texts have it all over the place. These three um, hypotheses are um, um, considered, at least by Baker, to be universal. Okay? They are independent of the source and the, and the target language. In contrast, we have interference, the fingerprints of the source, source language shining through. Teich called it in one, one of our papers. Um, and these will be manifested in various ways, and I will show you quite a lot, quite a lot of examples uh, soon. The main... Um, Maybe the main message of this, uh, of this talk is that there is a difference between the first three and the, and the last four. Uh, interference is all over the place. It really overshadows uh, the subtle marks of simplification, explicitation, and normalization. And in fact, we actually question the validity of, of the, the first three um, um, uh, hypotheses. If they do exist, they are probably not universal. They are... Um, um, they are marked also by uh, strong evidence of explicitation, and this will become clearer when I uh, move on. As I mentioned, um, my, uh, my main aim here is to do linguistic work, work in translation studies. My methodology, the methods I bring to this effort are computational. They reflect my background, but the research questions are definitely linguistic questions. So this is a contribution of computational linguistics to uh, humanities uh, studies. Having said that, understanding translation is, understanding the difference between originals and translations can and has been shown to be beneficial also for practical applications. So uh, we have shown in, in, uh, in a line of works that um, you can use those insights to improve the quality of statistical machine translation systems. Um, in particular, uh, language models compiled from translated texts are better for, translation, for machine translation than language models compiled from original texts. Um, if you use uh, parallel texts for compiling uh, translation models, then you better use parallel texts that were translated in the same direction as the task that you're working on. So if you're translating from French to English, you want the translation models to be compiled from parallel text, manually translated from French to English and not the other way around. And there are other applications as well, but um, the, the, the works that I will focus on today are, are aimed at a different direction. We want to un better understand the properties of translation. How do people translate? Why and in what sense, in what ways do translations differ from original texts? So that's the, um, that's the motivation. And I'll give you a very brief survey of uh, what has been done in the, in the very beginning. This is a, a slide that I found uh, somewhere on the web, and it shows the number of citations to papers that uh, use, uh, that, that deal with translation studies in general. This is the upper uh, plot, the straight line. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the solid line, and then uh, at the bottom, the dotted line is the number of citations to works that um, use database um, or corpus-based analysis, okay? And you see that the numbers are really very, very low. There has been some uh, steady growth, but still it's, it's very, very limited. So traditionally, from the 80s here, 
uh, translation studies scholars use um, uh, don't uh, don't base their papers on data. Okay, not on data as we think of data, right? And this uh, this this corpus-based analysis is something that only started recently, and uh, there are a few examples. So uh, here is a work uh, that's almost 20 years old that um, uh, that shows that the type token ratio, the the number of unique words divided by the number of words in a text is, uh, is uh, lower in translations. That's a reflection of the assumption that um, the translations use fewer unique words and therefore are simpler to understand. So this is simplification. And also uh, uh, mean sentence length is, is, is uh, lower in lexical density and stuff like that. So there has been a few works uh, in, in this direction. And uh, we are doing it in a completely different way. Okay, these, these earlier works used frequencies. They simply count. And this is illuminating, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. So our methodology is a little bit different. It's still corpus-based. We use text classification, both supervised and unsupervised, for distinguishing between translations and originals. And as, as you well know, at the heart of any text classification task, there is the question of uh, feature design. So what you do with text classification is you take those texts, you represent them as feature vectors, you feed them into some standard off-the-shelf classifier, and you get some machine that can distinguish between two classes. And you can um, um, uh, evaluate the accuracy of this machine in, uh, in classifying texts of the two varieties. In our case, it's originals versus translations. And the higher the accuracy, the more convinced you are that your feature set, the features with which you represent those texts, are relevant. If you used completely irrelevant features for representing those texts, your accuracy would be close to zero or to the baseline. And if you use very good features to represent your text, then you expect to have higher accuracy. So we use this methodology in order to evaluate the quality of the features. We don't care about the accuracy of the classifier in the end. This is not what I'm looking at. I don't want to improve my classifier, and I will Im immediately explain why this is completely uh, irrelevant question. I do care about the features, so we will experiment with various choices of feature sets, and we will try to define features that best reflect the hypothesis of translation studies. If the hypothesis is correct, we expect the features that are derived from it to be good distinguishers between originals and translations. So the features with which we represent the texts should reflect the linguistic characteristics of the differences between O and T that we expect to find in those, uh, in those texts. It is crucial that the features be content independent. And th this, is, this is really important to understand. If I'm looking at a text in English, and I know that this text can either be originally written in English or translated from French, then definitely I expect things like proper names, France, Paris, Orléans, but also common nouns, I don't know what, wine or cheese, to be overrepresented in translations from French simply because these words reflect the culture or other aspects, the sociology of the, of the society in which those texts were originally written, right? So this is completely uninteresting. It's not going to tell me anything about the differences between originals and translations. It's going to tell me some things about the French, but this is not what I'm interested in. So it's important that features be content independent and that they indicate formal and stylistic differences rather than content differences. And of course, we would like our features to be easy to interpret so that we can understand something about the properties of those texts. I'm not going to go over the next few slides in much detail. Um, we, we defined the set of, I don't know, 30-something features. So, for instance, for uh, studying simplification, we have features that compute the type token ratio. We have features that reflect mean word length and, and, and uh, um, the number of syllables in a word and the sentence length and lexical density. Rank is important, how frequent the word is. Uh, um, uh, how common it is in, in normal use, so uh, various features like this. And then we have uh, features that reflect uh, explicitation. 
Uh, the, more, the more important of those is the one at the bottom here called cohesive markers. This is a set of some 40 discourse markers, things like because, but, hence, that uh, translators tend to use in order to make the text more explicit. I'm going to skip over the other ones because they're not very important. And then we have features for uh, normalization. Again, um, uh, I'm not going to go over it in detail. And then we have features for interference. So simplification, explicitation, and normalization are considered to be universal. Explicitation is considered to be language pair dependent. So um, 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 we, uh, we, we want to be able to capture interference in some way, but we don't want to define features that are closely dependent on each of the languages. We don't want to know anything about these two languages. Interference can work in, 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 in two ways. So uh, uh, the example here is, uh, is uh, lexical interference. I don't know if you know the word doch in, in German. It's something that's very, very hard to translate into English. I, don't, I can't think of a single word or, or even a collection of words that would represent the meaning of doch. Hence, you expect doch to be overrepresented in, in German originals rather than in translation, say, from English to German, simply because nothing in English can trigger the generation of this word in German, because it doesn't have a clear counterpart in English. So this is lexical interference as, as under-representation of certain lexical items in the, in the translation. And there is also over-representation. So um, um, it's, it's common to start German uh, sentences by man ist, which is translated to English as one is. This is perfectly OK in English. It's just not very common to start a sentence by one is in English. So this pattern, these two, these two words, man, uh, one is, um, uh, sh is, we would expect it to be less frequent in, uh, in uh, uh, originals than in translations from German to English. These are lexical um, um, facets of uh, interference. We'll talk about other ones in a second. Oh, here, here it is. So uh, we, uh, we use several feature sets for uh, capturing interference. The most important one is part of speech trigrams in our case, uh, n-grams in general. Part of speech sequences capture shallow syntactic structures, and syntactic structures are very language dependent, right? Syntax is, is what makes languages differ from one another, in addition to the lexicon, of course. So if we, if we, um, um, if we use part of speech engrams as features, we expect those features to be able to capture the influence of the source on the target. And then we have character engrams and prefixes, suffixes, that doesn't matter much. Um, I'll, uh, I'll talk about, no, I'll, I'll skip talking about contextual function words, but positional token frequency is an important feature. Um, we look at the few words that begin and end sentences, the words themselves as features. And this is because the, um, the speaker has relatively uh, less freedom at the beginning and at the end of a sentence. I'll give you an example from the Europal corpus w with which we work a lot here. Um, it is very, very common for, you, you know what Europal is, right? It's the proceedings of the European Parliament and speakers would come to the podium and start their speeches and they will start by ladies and gentlemen, when they address the public. Only they don't. They don't do it in English. They simply don't do it in English. For some reason, English speakers at the European Parliament do not start their speeches by ladies and gentlemen, but everybody else does. So when you see translations from other languages into English, you see lots of ladies and gentlemen at the beginning of a sentence. The, it, it's common in French, it's common in German, it's common in the other languages of the European Union. Okay? So the beginning and the ends of sentences are important, so we use a positional uh, token frequencies to capture that. And then we have a, a, a plethora of other features um, that we couldn't really classify into one of those hypotheses, but they turn out to be important. One of them, obviously, is function words. Function words have been used since the 60s as a very good uh, indicator of style when you do uh, text classification. And um, uh, we know that function words are extremely uh, efficient in, say, distinguishing between the texts of men and women, younger and older people. Uh, so we expect them to be good uh, distinctors of uh, originals versus translation. And then pronouns, well, the, the, the rest are less important. At the very bottom, you see sanity check. For sanity, what we do is we represent texts by the frequencies of the tokens in the text, all the tokens, including common nouns, including proper nouns, okay? This we expect 
to capture the differences between O and T just by, by, by virtue of words like uh, France or Paris or cheese or wine, right? So we use both uh, unigrams and bigrams of, uh, of tokens. So far, you understand how we represent those texts. And again, the common idea is that we want to test the hypothesis. So we want to see whether certain feature sets are better at distinguishing between originals and translations than others. If a feature set is very good, then the hypothesis that this feature set is reflecting is probably valid. The other direction is not necessarily uh, so easy. Let's start with some results, OK? So this is, this is supervised classification. Um, do I have a, yeah, I have the setup here. So we use Europal. We have uh, uh, 4 million tokens in English. This is O, original. And we have uh, 4 million tokens in, uh, in English translated from several other languages. I think 10, 10 languages here. What we do is we tokenize the corpus. We split it into chunks of approximately 2,000 tokens in a chunk, uh, approximately because we do not want to break a sentence in the middle. And then uh, we, we run part speech tagging, and we do uh, text classification on those chunks, OK? So we have something like 2,000 chunks of O, 2,000 chunks of T. And uh, we use tenfold cross-validation. So we train on 90%, test on the remaining 10, and do it cyclically 10 times. OK, so these are, this is the experimental setup. And here are the results. So for sanity, we use token unigrams and token bigrams, and we get 100% accuracy in the classification. And this is just an indication of the fact that the task is extremely easy. Okay, As I told you, I'm not interested in accuracy here. I know that the task is easy. Here you see it's easy. And it's easy because translations reflect the culture and the society of the language from which they are translated. And this is, this is trivial. Okay, We didn't learn anything yet. But we know that the task is easy, and we now have an upper bound. These are the simplification features. And then, as you can see, I'm not going to go over this in detail. The, the accuracy ranges between 50-something to 70-something. It's OK. It means that there is something there. There is some signal, but it's not a very, very powerful signal. So those type token ratio uh, features do something, but they don't, they don't do something extremely useful. These are the explicitation features, and we're going up. There is more in explicitation than in simplification. So with cohesive markers, we get over 80% accuracy. These are just a set of 40 discourse markers, words and, and, and short phrases. But they do the job in 80% of the cases, which is not, uh, not, not very bad. And uh, if you look at the actual texts, and you now count frequencies, you see words like uh, moreover, for instance. Moreover is 17 times more frequent in translations than in originals. It's, it's a clear indication that something is going on there. The translators do add those uh, explicitation markers to the text. The same goes with thus and besides and other words. Normalizations, uh, 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 normalizations showed us nothing. We couldn't find any evidence of normalization. Part of it is because um, uh, the features we used didn't really capture normalization in a very powerful way, but we put it aside for the time being. What's interesting now is, uh, is uh, interference. And look at what we're getting with interference. With par part of speech unigrams, just frequencies of part of speech tags, we get 90% accuracy in classification. That's quite extraordinary. We're not looking at the texts anymore, right? We're only looking at the parts, parts of speech, and we only have histograms of some, I don't know, 40, 60 part of speech tags. That's all and you get 90% uh, accuracy. And with trigrams, you're almost at ceiling, right, with 90, uh, 98%. And uh, the same goes for character uh, n-grams, and the same goes for contextual function words and positional token frequencies, OK? Very, very high frequency. In fact, um, you may think that the reason uh, that the accuracy here is, uh, is high may be due to the uh, dimensionality of the vectors, but we do dimensionality redu reduction, and we work with um, um, we work with the uh, top uh, 300 uh, features in, in each of these sets. And even when you limit the dimensionality of the vectors to 300, you still get you know, upper 90 uh, accuracy figures. And the reason is that there really is a difference in the syntactic structure of the, uh, of the originals and the translations. As you can see here, this is a, a histogram showing the frequency of a particular part of speech trigram. I apologize for the typo. This is model followed by the verb 
to B followed by uh, VBN. So uh, the, the participle, things like um, um, uh, could be written or stuff like that. What you see at the bottom is not languages, okay? This is English, but this is not German. This is English translated from German. This is English translated from Italian. This is English translated from Finnish. And you see huge uh, differences in the frequencies of these constructions. Now, I know nothing about Finnish, but apparently the equivalent construction is very frequent in Finnish, thereby forcing or, or at least influencing the translator into creating these structures in the English which is, don't forget, his or her native language. But still, it's there. Those, those structures of the source are there. And even when the translator is producing English, it's evident. You see the, the huge differences. OK, so uh, this concludes the, the, the part that's dedicated to uh, supervised classification. And I want to move on to unsupervised classification, which um, which is, um, okay, and I'll, I'll motivate it here. So uh, um, uh, obviously supervised classification inherently depends on uh, the availability of annotated data. So you need corpora where you know whether the text is, is uh, original or, or translated. These, these things are hard to come by. And of course, when, uh, when you train a classifier on an annotated corpus, then you don't know how well this classifier can be generalized to other domains. And when I say domain here, I mean just a different data set, okay? The different domains could differ because they belong to different registers or, or different genres, or maybe the source language is different for the translations. There are some differences, okay? So the question we asked in this, uh, in this work was, to what extent do our classifiers that produced really high accuracy on the task of distinguishing originals from translation, to what extent can be generalized to new domains? And the answer is mm, to a very small extent. So the data set we used here are Europal, the same data set we had before, but we also add the, the Canadian Hansar. These are the proceedings of the Canadian Parliament, which are um, um, given in both English and French, some translated in this direction and some the other. And we also added literary, literary uh, classics from the 19th century. The reason we use the 19th century texts is that uh, they're available on the uh, Project Gutenberg. And a very small data set of uh, TED Talks, both in English and TEDx Talks in other languages of, uh, other than English. Um, Okay, so the first thing we did we, was we replicated the experiments of, um, of uh, supervised classification. Uh, we repeated the experiments hoping to replicate the results, and this is what you get on the four data sets. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the features here are function words, character trigrams, part of speech trigrams, contextual function words, and cohesive markers, the ones that were pretty much good in the previous experiments. Uh, cohesive markers, the last one on the bottom is not interference. All the rest are attributed to interference. And you see that the results are excellent across data sets. A little bit less on the, on the literature data set because you know, these are literary translations and uh, you would expect the, uh, uh, the translators who, pro who translate literary texts, especially classics, to uh, divert more from the original and to be more creative and to produce better target language than you would expect the guys who do the translations for the European Union and are paid by the hour or by the word or who knows what, okay? Uh, both of them produce original work, but you, you would expect literary translations to be higher quality in some way. And, and, and you see that, uh, you see that here. Notice that with TED we, we can get up to 100% accuracy, so this is much easier. It's a much smaller data set though. Okay, so this looks good, right? So supervised classification on the four data sets works very well. What happens when you train a classifier on one data set, but that, then test it on another data set? What happens is this. So you train on Europal and test on Hansard. This is parliamentary proceedings, but these are done in, in Canada. These are done in Brussels. And, uh, and uh, you see the, the accuracy drops to 60%. So we almost have nothing there. This is with function words as features. Okay? And whatever pair you take, you see horrible results. What this means is that there is a signal of translation is. There is a signal 
that distinguishes between originals and translations in each data set independently. But this signal is overshadowed by the much more powerful signal of the difference between the data sets. That's it. You have different data sets. You, can't, you, you can no longer do this. If you, do, um, um, if you train on two data sets on test on the third, it's still as bad. Okay? It's still 60s. What you do when you find such, um, such uh, over-tuning to your training set is uh, you try to do unsupervised classification, which is what we tried to do. We, we used uh, standard clustering algorithms and assuming that we know the actual label. So unsupervised uh, classification can do stuff for you. It, it can take a bunch of texts and separate it to two subsets, but it won't be able to give you the label for each of the subsets, right? It doesn't know anything about originals or translations because there was no training. But with our common um, uh, feature sets, we can get pretty high uh, accuracy results even with unsupervised classification, which shows you that, again, there's something in those uh, texts that can really distinguish between originals and translation, even without training you get up to 97% on, on Europal, and with literature, which is a harder uh, corpus, almost 80%. This is assuming gold label. So this is assuming that we look at the two clusters obtained, and we say, oh, okay, these are the originals and these are the translations, then we are left with, uh, I don't know, 5 to 20% of error. Having said that, uh, it would be good to be able to label those clusters automatically, and we developed a relatively simple method for labeling those, uh, those clusters based on language modeling. I'm going to gloss over it. I'm only going to point your attention to the last two bullets. So first, with our labeling algorithm, we can determine the label of the resulting clusters with 100% accuracy across all our experiments. So it's as good as saying, okay, we now have an unsupervised method that can distinguish between originals and translations based on these, uh, the feature sets that we've seen. And it can tell you which of the two clusters is O and which one is T with, with perfect accuracy. This, this labeling is done with perfect accuracy, not the classification. And once we have the labeling algorithm, we can now uh, use majority voting w uh, among various feature sets and, and, and see whether we can improve the results. And the um, observation is yes, we can improve the results. So this is when you work only with, feature, with function words at the top and then um, two sets of three feature sets and then at the bottom all our features together. And as you can see, we reach up to 90. 95% with Europol, 91% with Hansard, almost 80% with literature. And that means that the, the, the take home message here is that it is possible with high accuracy to do unsupervised classification of originals versus translations in various domains. And now we want to go back to our original question. What happens when you mix the things together? What happens to the signal? Wow. To the signal of... Um, of uh, translation is, well, what happens is that it goes away. When you mix all your data sets together and you run this unsupervised classification, you get perfect, almost perfect accuracy by domain and not by translation is. This is by domain. So these are bad news. This means that the stronger signal there is, that, is the data set. Well, uh, we developed two simple methods for um, taking care of that. We first classify by domain, and then we classify by translation is features, and these are the end results. This is classif unsupervised classification of translation is across various data sets, and you can see that even when you have two different data sets, it's okay. Uh, it goes uh, farther down when the two data sets are very, very different from each other. When you have three data sets, then the results are not as good. Still, it's, it's unsupervised, so it's, uh, it's, it's better than nothing. You have three different data sets here, but it's, 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 the, the assumption is that the more diverse your corpus is going to be, the less uh, accurate you're going to be in your classification. I don't have much time, but I want to talk about, uh, about interference. So we saw that interference is what doing the work here. It's those fingerprints of the source on the target that makes uh, the, the 
the major differences between originals and translations. So now, if this is indeed the case, we can uh, raise a few, uh, a few new hypotheses. One of them is that when we're looking at translations into, say, English from two different languages, one and two, then, um, uh, then we expect translations from language one to be different from translations from language two because interference carries over the fingerprints of the source and they will be different. And the second, which is a little more subtle, if the two source languages are closer to each other, we would expect translations from these two uh, languages into English to be closer to each other. Closer than, say, translations from some third language that's a little more distant from the two original ones. And these uh, uh, assumptions are motivated by work that's got nothing to do with translation on um, native language identification. If, I, if I'll have time, I'll show you just one or two slides on native language identification. This is the task of giving some texts written, say, in English by learners of English whose native language is diverse. Um, um, uh, can you identify the, language, the native language of the speaker? So uh, the answer to this, uh, uh, to this question is yes, you can. This task can be done with high degree of accuracy. If I'll have time, I'll talk a bit about that. But this is the motivation. So we want to do the same thing with translations. There is a major difference, right? A major difference. Translations are done by native speakers of, in our case, the target language is always English. So translations are performed by native speakers of English. Can you do the same thing? Can you, can you identify the source language from which those texts were translated? There was one early work about seven years ago by Coppel and Odan in which they trained classifier to distinguish between originals and translations from L1 and tested them on translations from L2. And what you see here is that the diagonal is, is very, very good. This is with function words. The diagonal is very good, so it's almost ceiling. But then when you train a classifier to, to distinguish original English from English translated from French and test it on English translated from Italian, it's not as good. German, even worse. Finnish, the worst. So that gives you an idea that translations into English from French and Italian are, are, are probably more similar to each other than, say, from Finnish. So this, this was the question. Uh, what we did was we used translations from 14 European languages into English. We used part speech trigrams, our strongest feature set, as, uh, as features. And this 14-way classification task, for which the baseline is 7%, can be done with an accuracy of 76%. Okay? So this was the accuracy of the supervised classifier in tenfold cross-validation, whose task was to distinguish between um, um, uh, English translated from 14 different languages. What's interesting here is to look at the confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix will tell you, okay, this was a chunk translated from French into English, but the classifier thought that it was translated from Italian in how many cases. And this is what it looks like. You don't have to see the numbers, of course, or even the uh, labels of the languages on the top, but you have to understand that the diagonal is, is what we aim at, right? The diagonal means that uh, our classifier predicted that the text was translated from Spanish, and it indeed was translated from Spanish. What, what we did here is we grouped the languages according to language family. So at the top you have English, Dutch, German, Danish, and Swedish, all Germanic languages. Then the next block is Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, Romanian, all Romance languages. And then you have uh, Slavic languages. And you see that even when the classifier makes mistakes, the, those errors tend to be in the family. So the errors are intra-family rather than inter-family. So this gave us an idea. What if we don't do supervised classification on this data set? What if we do clustering, unsupervised, but we do hierarchical clustering? So we try to group chunks. This time the chunks reflect a single language, so we have 14 chunks of texts in English translated from various languages. And we try to find which two chunks are closest to each other and, uh, and, and, and then two more chunks and so on and so forth, hierarchically, and work out a tree of translations from various languages into English. What are the results going to be? 
You know the European tree of languages, so this is known from historical linguistics. We know how those uh, languages have developed from Proto-Indo-European all the way through Latin, which is Proto-Romance, if you wish, and Proto-Germanic and Proto-Slavic. And this is the gold tree, okay? This is, this is known. This is what we believe in. Once we do hierarchical clustering on our Englishes translated from various languages, this is what we get. It's not perfect, but it's not very bad either. In blue, you see the Slavic languages. In red, you see the Romance languages. In green, you see the Germanic languages. It's not very bad. What you see here is a reconstruction of some 5,000 years of historical linguistics Looking at English only, I, I find this fascinating. The names of languages there are not really names of languages. They're just names of the source languages from the, which the English was translated. We, we, we uh, pretty accurately reconstruct the Indo-European tree of languages based only on English. Just on English. And you know what? We can do it with French also. This is what happens when we work with French. The results are not as good. But French here is not translated from Italian, Spanish, German, and so on. It's translated from English. So this is what happens when you translate from all those 14 languages into English and then translate from English into French. Two phases of translation and the signal of the source language is still there. It's not perfect. It's not 100% accurate, but it's not bad. The signal is so powerful that it can survive two phases of translation. We did some, uh, um, some quantitative analysis of this thing. I don't want to bother you with that, and I don't have enough time. Um, um, but what you can see in this slide is that the more the feature set reflects interference, the better the uh, a lower number is better here. These are distances between our trees and the, and the, and the gold tree, so the lower is the better. Um, uh, so with uh, part of switch trigrams and function words, you get the best results. And with cohesive markers, which is not interference, you get almost random results. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, I'll skip over the analysis. Yes, I will. Uh, I'll tell you two words about, um, about translation and non-native language because this is a fascinating area and uh, this is what I would like to do in, in, in future years. So the idea is that both translations and non-native language, when I say non-native language, I mean a lot of things. This could be learners, like, you know, 12-year-olds uh, learning English, or even students who come from uh, around the world and are trying to be admitted into universities in the United States and have to pass the TOEFL exam. Or they could be very, very fluent non-native speakers, like speakers of the European Parliament who prefer to speak in English rather than in their mother tongue. Uh, presumably, they're, they're, they're highly fluent, uh, but, they're not, but not, they're not native. So, um, uh, it's, it's clear that there are similarities between translations and non-native language, because both are affected by the presence of two linguistic systems in the same mind. There's no way around it. And maybe there are some cognitive, pays, uh, cognitive uh, uh, prices to pay. And uh, on the other hand, translations are produced by, uh, by uh, native speakers. So we did some work on, um, this is, uh, these are results on, of uh, native language identification. I'll skip that. We did some work on uh, distinguishing between native, non-native, and translated language. And as you can see, the, this, the uh, separating between native and non-native can be done with uh, excellent accuracy, but also uh, of course, nat uh, native, uh, so originals and translations, but also separating between non-natives and translations can be done very, very accurately, but not as good an accuracy. So, uh, so we, we hypothesize that non-native language and translation is closer to each other more than they are to native original language, and this is reflected here. If you do uh, uh, dimensionality reduction to three dimensions, you see native in blue, non-native in red, translations in green. Once you reduce it to two dimensions, you see that the non-native and the translations are clustered together and they're separated from native. We have more results, but I don't have more time, unfortunately. So let me just conclude. 
uh, we, uh, I, I think I showed you quite convincingly that it's very easy to uh, distinguish between original and translated text. It's also possible to identify the language from which a text was translated with high accuracy. Uh, some of those uh, translation studies universals are probably not as universal as one would think. They are in, in, uh, at least overshadowed by the much more powerful signal of, uh, of uh, interference. Those features that reflect the fingerprints of the source on the translation output outcome are the strongest one, um, and uh, by definition, this is not a pair-specific, language-specific uh, phenomenon. So, uh, even with the powerful signal of uh, interference, there are more powerful signals that are an artifact of the, of the domain. Okay. Um, going back to the very few uh, last words that I, I mentioned, uh, even though uh, translations and non-native language are very, very different phenomena, there are certain common lines between the two. Uh, in particular, we see uh, lower lexical richness, both in non-native productions and in translations. So uh, type token ratio is, is very, very different. More careful choice of idiomatic expressions. Multi-word expressions are used differently in, uh, in non-native and translations than they are in original text. And uh, probably subconscious excessive use of explicitation, cohesive markers, both in translations, as we've seen, and in non-native speech. And much more research is, is needed in order to really pin down what's similar between non-native productions and translations and what sets them apart. And with this, I will just say a few words about future translations, uh, future directions. So we worked on translation is in several languages. We did some work on Hebrew as well. This is no longer future direction. Um, we do work on extending our results to more domains and more data sets. But really, the most uh, uh, interesting two directions are two. One of them is to, um, to do robust identification of machine translation output. So it's very easy to distinguish between machine translation and, uh, and human translation. But when the size of your chunk is very, very small, say a single sentence, then it becomes harder. So given a sentence pair, uh, can you detect what, the direc what direction it was uh, uh, translated in. And uh, in particular, I would love to work more on these distinctions between non-native uh, non language and, and translation in a general broad, broader view of, of what bilingualism actually is and what characterizes the bilingual mind. Thank you very much. I, I stole five minutes of your time, but we still have ample time, right? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. So I just had two questions. Well, the first one is, uh, do you have any idea what's the human performance on this task? You know, how people are aware, you know, that... that uh, so for identifying translation is, it's horrible, depending on the data set. Um, um, I didn't do the experiments, but I think uh, Bernardi, uh, um, um, Baroni and Bernardini did that. And uh, I think it was like, I don't know, maybe 60% or something like that. What we did do was on native uh, language identification, which is a different task. Um, uh, we did some uh, human experiments and it was exactly chance level. We had, uh, we had uh, 11 um, native languages and, uh, and, uh, and the human performance was exactly chance, 9%. And we, we reached 85%. So, so for up one is what the minimal size you know of documents you need to have in order to have reliable statistics that you can compute. So I don't know what's the size of a Europal parliament you are using, you know, to. Uh, we used four million tokens in the Europal experiments. Um, what What's important is not really the um, the size of the training corpus. What's important is the size of the chunk. We worked yeah. with mm -hmm. chunks of two thousand tokens. When you reduce the chunk size to one thousand tokens. Performance drops down a little bit, not by very much. When you go down to the sentence level, it's, it's almost chance, so it's somewhere in between. Would you make any difference between the text translation 
I mean, we are a translator, has plenty of time to make it perfect or almost perfect, and interpretation where it has to be real time. Mm. And, and so mm. people, you know, there are some constraint of uh, real time of... Uh, yeah. uh, so this is an excellent question. We never worked with interpretation. I would love to work with interpretation because I think that interpretation shows very, very dramatically certain cognitive aspects of this very complicated task, but also interference from the source language. We don't have the data sets, unfortunately. Uh, some people work with interpretation in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark, in the Copenhagen uh, School of Business, but I don't have access to their data sets. Um, I, I should say something about, um, about the time. So th when, when, uh, when you work with a translation agency, uh, they have their criteria for quality of translation, right? And usually, the, it's, it's the customer who defines the criteria. Do you know what the cri first criterion is? I want it tomorrow. Okay, so that's the first criterion for the evaluation of the quality of human translation. Of course, Google will give it to you now, not tomorrow, but it's not the only quality, uh, quality criterion out there. I would love to work with interpretation. Unfortunately, I never did. But Europol doesn't, uh, UNSAT doesn't have a, I mean, transcription, written transcription of interpretation? It's, it's, it's not interpretation. The, the way the Europol proceedings are produced is, is extremely complicated. It's a horrible data set because of this, uh, this reason. So uh, the, the speeches are given in the parliament orally, but I'm sure that many of them are just read and they, they were written beforehand. But then the, the uh, parliament members hand over the speeches uh, to language editors. They do some language editing and then the texts are translated. So it's, not, it's got nothing to do with interpretation, nothing. Thank you for this uh, pretty interesting talk. Um, my question is, since you know what makes original uh, text different from translated text, have you tried to erase these discriminative features from uh, machine translation such that it looks like original translations? Uh, Original text. I mean. I, I'm not sure what you mean by removing those features. You cannot remove part of speech trigrams. Well, yeah, post processing and well, if, I have in mind machine translation. So in machine translation, you can generate several hypotheses for a given mm. uh, translation. Mm. So in that case, you can pick the one which looks the most like original text. So let me tell you what we did. Okay, um, I don't know if I can switch back there. Uh, we did uh, two things, two, two sets of experiments. In one of them, we um, created SMT systems in which, the, uh, in which the language model was compiled from original English. You translate French to English. Okay, let's fix the task. You translate French to English. Now, you, you have a monolingual corpora from which you want to compile your language models. You can use original English or English translated from French. You would expect that original English would be better for this task. This is Shakespeare, right? What, what, what best model would you want to, to train your language model from? No. Translations from French are better. Translations in general are better, and specifically from French. Okay? So this is one thing we did. The other thing is a little bit more tricky. You have a parallel corpus. You, you're translating French to English. You have a parallel French-English corpus. You want to tr compile um, a translation model. I, I need to switch back there. It was at the very beginning. I'll, I'll just show the references. Here it is, the, the first uh, two ones. Um, so you have a parallel corpus and you want to compile a translation model. Obviously, if you take those, this, the subset of the parallel corpus that was translated French to English, manually translated French to English, and you compile a translation model from that one, it's far better than the rest of the, of the parallel corpus. Ten times better. What we did do was we said, okay, you can take it, but you have also the other subset, which may be ten times larger. Don't you want, you don't want to just throw it away. So we did some domain adaptation techniques in which we sort of made the part of the corpus that was manually translated in the wrong direction look a little bit more similar to the other part of the corpus using very simple domain adaptation techniques, and that improved the results quite dramatically. If you have a better way of fooling your SMT system into thinking that uh, the corpora that it's, it's trained on are, are better corpora, I'd be happy to hear. We can talk about it offline. Ah, yeah. 
for this uh, very, very interesting talk. I have uh, three short questions. Uh, <laughs> first, did you, into German, did you take the ratio of compound nouns as an in the possible feature? The second question is whether uh, the hypothetical, say, translation universal, that is the expansion factor, is a real one or not? Oh, just, a, just a second. Let, let me answer the first one. No, we did not look at compound nouns mm -hmm. in German. We tried to define features that, that would work across languages. Plus, we never looked at the source languages. We only looked at the translations. We didn't, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't okay. always have access to the source okay, language. Okay, okay. Then look at compound nouns in translations. The ratio of compound nouns might be different if it is coming from German or from English or, or from French, etc. Did you consider this one? Yes, we had, when we did, when we did uh, um, um, source language identification, that was in the analysis that I skipped over, we did something a little bit similar. Um, no, it's not here. It's, ah, I don't have the slide. Uh, we looked at the, uh, at the, at the number of, uh, the frequency of patterns of the sort, uh, noun of noun. Because uh, possessive constructions behave very, very differently in the, the, in the various European languages, and we, we expected it to be reflected in the translation, and that, and that was actually the case. Okay. And the last question is, as follows, I remember 11 years ago at Colin 2006 in Manchester, there was a very interesting paper on tracking the translation path for text in Europal, because many translations actually are done in two steps. They are done, for instance, into French, and then from directly from whatever, German into Italian. And the, the paper there was able to show, I mean, said he was able to track uh, this translation path. So did you observe that? I'm, un of? I'm unfamiliar with the paper. I would love to find it. If you could send me a link, I'd be very grateful. No, what I we did do was we worked, we worked with the European Union. Proceedings of Calling 2006. Calling 2006. In six. Six, in, in, uh, I think, in Manchester. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it. Uh, we did work with the translation agency that does the translations for the European Union, and they told us for sure that everything is translated into English and then from English into the other languages. So... Our English Europal corpus was originally was directly translated from the source languages. The French one was uh, translated via English. That is not true. It is not true. For instance, French, Italian, etc. Yeah, because they had translation systems. Cistron, they used very late, and translations were directly post-edited from translation from French into Italian, for instance, which they developed after seventy-six. They, it's not true that everything goes through English. Yeah, that's, that, that would be interesting to, uh, to, to verify. We, ha we actually have a letter from them. <laughs> but yeah, we, we can talk about it. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I have a question about, uh, I don't know if you have the data, but um, is it possible to find uh, influence from uh, individual translators? Could that be a factor that uh, explains something? Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a factor. Unfortunately, we don't have any access to such information. I'll give you just uh, a, a brief answer. Uh, one thing we wanted to do was identify, to identify gender traits. Okay, we worked a, we worked a little bit on, on gender traits. And you know that it's, it's, it's possible to classify with high accuracy um, text written by uh, men and women. High accuracy, meaning 75-80% accuracy on this binary task, okay? What we thought was that it would be extremely interesting to look at translations and to classify four ways by the gender of the author and the gender of the translator. And we thought that the signal would still be there, but we simply couldn't have any access to the data set that reflected that. We are now collecting a small data set in Hebrew of uh, literary translations in which we know the gender, uh, all the details of the, of the authors and the translators because these are literary works. We'll see. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you.